Hello, everybody. Welcome into Rapid 30. I'm going to give everyone a second. I was making sure all of our screens were up and running. But um, as I said, welcome in to Rapid 30. If you haven't joined a Rapid 30 NCLEX practice yet, here is how it works. Super simple. We are just going to do a fast and furious 30 minutes of practice questions. All for the NCLEX, we are going to go through them. I'm going to give you about a minute per question, and then you're going to tell me what your answer is. I'm going to tell if you're right or wrong and how I would get to the correct answer. So drop a comment for me with where you're joining from today, whether you are in the Zoom room with us on YouTube, Facebook, or Instagram. Tell me where in the world you're tuning in from. I'm broadcasting from North Carolina. That is my home state. Hi, Felita. Good to catch you online. I'm so glad you could join our Rapid 30. I'm looking forward to this. Let's see. Chicago, Canada. Welcome from Instagram. Those are great. Okay, perfect. So let's jump in. As I said, this is a really fast 30 minutes, so we're not going to waste any time. Okay. The very first practice question is the nurse is caring for a post-stroke client and suddenly they have a fixed dilated pupil. What's the most appropriate action? Okay. So follow my answer choices here. Are we reducing stimuli, reassessing after 10 minutes, no biggie, checking their BP, or are we notifying that physician right away? Pop your answer down in the comments. Let us know what you're thinking. And we're going to explain how we got the answer. I see C, I see D. Let's see what my friends on Zoom say. D, okay, okay. I agree with you guys that said D. Excellent job, notify that physician. Here is your answer rationale. D is correct because if we have a fixed dilated pupil over there in anybody, honestly, let me just say, it is a bad sign. It means brain injury. What do we want our pupil assessment to be? There's an acronym. Does anybody remember it? It starts with a P. Yes, you guys do remember it. Nice job, Mary Mawat. It is PERLA, P-E-R-R-L-A. We want our pupils to be equal, round, and reactive to light and accommodation. If one of them is fixed and it's dilated, it tells us brain injury for sure. Now, post-stroke, I'm even more concerned because I think, wow, maybe a clot has gone to their brain and maybe brain tissue is dying. Maybe the pressure in that brain is going up. You see that increased ICP. So let's go back to our answer choices here. We know always if we're the nurse and there's something we can do to fix it, we do it. Reducing environmental stimuli, not fixing brain damage. Reassessing or checking BP, not fixing brain damage. And if we can't do anything, we need to get someone in the room who can. So notifying that physician, you got it. Absolutely correct. Okay, rapid 30. Here's our next one. We've got a client with a potassium level at 5.7. Remember the NGN is going to give you reference ranges. Woo, you don't have to memorize a bunch of crazy lab values. So they're going to give it to you in the question just like this. Normal K is 3.5 to 5. So even though you don't have to memorize 5.7, you need to understand what it means. Hyperkalemia, and we need to ask what is a possible cause of that hyperkalemia, okay? It's a select all that apply, of course. So take a look, A, B, C, D. Let me know down in the answers which one is possibly correct. Cushing's disease, can it cause hyperkalemia? Go through each one like a true false. Make it easy on yourself. Good. Let's see who's got it. Yep, Mary Rose from Zoom. You're on it. Nice job. Gigi, I like it. Looking good. Okay. Let's check it out. Absolutely. 
C and E, okay? C and E. So those were our salt substitutes and our adrenal insufficiency. Those two things you guys definitely should know can increase that potassium level, no doubt about it. Salt substitutes, why is that? Well, salt's usually sodium, and if we can't have sodium, we need to make something taste salty, we're gonna try something else. And that something is largely potassium. So those salt substitutes, you guys, really high in potassium. I especially want to clue you in on making sure your clients who are in renal failure do not take salt substitutes. Because we know, right, renal failure, they can already get some hyperkalemia and they're not supposed to eat a lot of salt either. So they might go for those substitutes and it's just going to make it worse. Okay. So that's a really good teaching point. Now, our other answer, if I go back and show you, was that adrenal insufficiency, right? Adrenal insufficiency. So why can that cause high potassium? Well, in adrenal insufficiency, we're not making enough of those steroids. That's what our adrenal glands do. One of the things the adrenal glands make, aldosterone. If we're not making enough aldosterone, what happens? Okay, well, think about what aldosterone usually does to kind of try and work through this in your brain. Aldosterone really helps you hold on to sodium and water so that your um, blood pressure can go up. And in exchange for, you know, holding on to that salt and water, we're going to get rid of potassium. That's how aldosterone usually works. And if we have adrenal insufficiency, then we're not making enough of it. So that means we are going to lose potassium. We're going to have less potassium elimination going on since the aldosterone's not doing its usual thing. All right. And with less potassium elimination, obviously you guys got it at this point. K going up, we can have that hyperkalemia. Why was A incorrect? Well, with Cushing's disease, it is the opposite of adrenal insufficiency. So we're going to have really high levels of aldosterone making a ton of it and therefore excreting lots of potassium. So with Cushing's, think low potassium. With aldosterone insufficiency, adrenal insufficiency, think high potassium, okay? Now B, why was that incorrect? NG tube desuction. Do we have a lot of potassium in our gut? You guys know we do. We store a ton of potassium in our belly. We pop a tube down there and put it to suction. We're taking away a lot of potassium, low potassium. Lastly, D, why is hyperinsulinism wrong? When we have a lot of insulin in our body, what's it doing? Think about how insulin works. Remember, it's that key that unlocks our cells so glucose can go inside, huh? So obviously, blood sugar is going to be low. We get that. But how, how does potassium play into this? Well, think about where potassium lives. You guys, tell me down in your chats. Does potassium live inside or outside the cells? Where is it supposed to be? Tell me. Yes, Mary says inside the cell. Yes, Sharon says inside the cell. What do you guys think over there on Facebook? Inside or outside of the cell? Yeah, Kamika says inside, 100%. Potassium's supposed to live inside that cell. You got it. So when the insulin opens up the cell and the glucose rushes inside, so does the potassium. And that's why if we have a boatload of insulin, hyperinsulinism, you know what, guys? All that potassium, it's going to rush inside the cells. And that's what's going to lead to our hypokalemia. So all three of those other choices, the Cushing's, the NG tube, the hyperinsulinism, they would cause a change in potassium level, but it would be low. It would not be that 5.7. Okay, there was a lot of stuff to review with that one. I hope it was helpful. Rapid 30, on to the next one. We're still in endocrine land. We're teaching a client with Graves' disease. So which statements indicate effective understanding? Okay, take a look down here for me. I'll report if my pulse is less than 60. I'm going to add hot yoga into my exercise routine. I'm going to increase fiber in my diet. Or um, I should report if the top number in my blood pressure is over 140. What do we think? These all sound kind of healthy, right? But where client has Graves disease. So what do we want to do? Let's see. Diana says D. Jemmy says 
C. All right. Got some people on Instagram that say D. Justine says D. I'm seeing a lot of Ds. Janet on Facebook agrees D. And I agree with you guys, D. I should report if the top number of my blood pressure is over 140. Let's think about why. What is happening in Graves' disease, my friends? We're making a lot of thyroid hormone, right? It's the opposite of hypothyroidism. It's one of our kinds of hyper thyroidism where the thyroid gland really goes into overdrive and we're just pumping out thyroid hormone because our, our feedback loop is broken. Yeah. So now think what does thyroid hormone actually do to my body? Well, it's like that gas in the car. It's my metabolism. It's going to heat my body up, make my heart beat, make my blood pressure go high. I'm going to be sweating, losing weight, hot, 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 right? Okay. So with all that going on, we have to think that this client is at risk for high blood pressure. So we definitely want them keeping an eye and telling us, hey, my systolic is above 140. That's why D was right. But let's look at our other choices because they all kind of inherently seemed fine, right? For the average poor person, like, okay, I'm going to report if I'm bradycardic. I'm going to go to hot yoga. I'm going to get more fiber in my diet. These are all fine. But these are not what we would recommend for someone with Graves' disease. We just talked about how their heart rate is going to be high. So I'm not telling them to report if it's low. I want to report if it's high. Now, why don't we want them to go to hot yoga? They're already hot. They've already got too much gas in the car. That's going to exacerbate their symptoms. And extra fiber in their diet? Their GI tract is already moving at hyper speed. We don't want to speed it up with fiber because they might not get good nutrient absorption. So this is one time where we don't recommend a high fiber diet. That's why D is absolutely correct. Good job. Okay, we're almost halfway through Rapid 30. Here's our next one. The perinatal nurse is caring for a client who is experiencing suspected placental abruption. Yikes. Signs and symptoms that would be expected. What do you got? Select all the signs and symptoms of placental abruption here, okay? Okay. Oh, I'm starting to get some answers. Dylan has got it from Facebook. Very good. Okay. Judith on YouTube. Absolutely. Okay. What do we got over here on Zoom? Yep. Jeffrey. Very nice. All right. All right. All right. The correct three answers here. B, C, and D. B, C, and D are our signs of a placental abruption. Okay. Okay. So B, that one was a dark red bleeding. When our placenta ruptures, there is a massive amount of bleeding. This is what's most likely to kill mom and even possibly kill baby because they just lose so much blood. And it is a dark, dark red blood because we're seeing all that arterial blood that's oxygenated. Now let's compare that to choice A, which was incorrect, painless bleeding. If there's no pain, there's bleeding and it's a bright red blood, what complication is this more likely to be? Tell me down in the chat. You guys definitely for the NCLEX have to know both of these conditions, okay? Painless bleeding, what do we got? Yes, Catherine, absolutely. That is right, Fiona. Dylan, yes, it's more likely to be a placenta previa, okay? So you guys definitely know the difference between these top two here. Painless, bright red, Previa, massive, painful, dark red bleeding, that is an abruption. Okay, now I said C and D are also right. Hypotension, why is that right? We're losing blood, we just said it. Less blood, less volume, less pressure. This is obviously gonna be dangerous for a baby. And then a board-like abdomen. Why are they getting a board, like rigid abdomen? All that blood, it's building up. Blood, blood, blood and that abdomen becomes very hard. This is a dangerous situation. Now, 
Some of you said eat. Some of you said, oh yeah, fetal tachycardia. This makes sense for mom, right? Losing blood, heart rate goes up to compensate. That's not how a fetus would respond. If this said maternal tachycardia, I would say you are right. But the fetus is not going to have tachycardia. Remember, we want baby's heart rates to be pretty high. The fetus will respond with bradycardia. Remember in our uh, uh, fetal heart rate lecture, if you, if you watch our on-demand videos at Archer, we talk about decelerations, right? When the heart rate slows down, and that is super dangerous. We get really, really, really worried about that. So fetal tachycardia, not correct. We're worried about bradycardia. That's officially the halfway point. Okay, any questions for me? Pop them down in the chat before we do our next question. Anything at all you guys want me to answer before we go on to the next one? We're going to do a little pharma because I know pharmacology is like the absolute hardest. Okay, no questions from here on Zoom. No questions here. Good. Okay. You guys must be ready for the next one. So I said we're going into pharma, right? I know this is a this is a pain point. Nobody really likes the pharmacology. Our nurse is caring for a client prescribed clozapine. So which data should we monitor? Another select all that apply. You guys got to get good at these. We're going to just do them as much as we can. Should we monitor their weight, their CBC, urine gravity, fasting blood glucose, total cholesterol. Now I want to remind you guys, test taking strategy, you can have all of these answers be correct or just one of them could be correct. Okay. So which ones are we monitoring if our clients on clozapine? Let's see. Andy got it. Okay. Nice job. Lots of good answer here. Mm -hmm. Give you guys a second. This is a hard one. You got to think through every answer choice, okay? Yeah, JJ, okay. Good, good, good. Okay, let's hit it. We've got a lot of correct answer choices. There's a lot to review with this question. A, B, D, and E, all four of those are absolutely correct. C is the only one that's wrong. Now, when I look at these answer choices, we go back to it, something kind of jumps out to me as a nurse. I see weight, urine, or, and fasting blood glucose, and total cholesterol, A, D, and E. Okay, all of those kind of, at least in some way, go together. If I gain a lot of weight, maybe I'm diabetic, maybe I'm not eating right, whatever the reason is, my blood glucose could be going up. And again, if I'm getting too many saturated fats, cholesterol, all of these kind of go in together with like a metabolic syndrome, right? Right. That's why A, D, and E are all correct. Because clozapine puts you at risk for metabolic disturbances. So when you see all three things there that kind of relate together, think about what are the risks of that drug? What are the overarching things they can do? And if it can cause this metabolic disturbance, right? Then you know, A, weight, we need to keep an eye on it. Their weight could be going up. D, blood glucose, yeah, they could have a high one. And same with total cholesterol. That's why those are all correct. Now, there's an additional reason that our CBC answer choice B was correct. Another thing clozapine puts you at risk for is something called a granulocytosis, where our neutrophil count goes down. So we specifically from that CBC, I mean, yeah, I'm going to see their platelets. Yeah, I'm going to see their H&H. &H, but what I really want to see is their white blood cell count. I want to know if those neutrophils are going down, because if they are, we're at really high risk for infection. Okay, so that's why we need a CBC. The only incorrect one down here, my friends, was that urine-specific gravity. I'm not saying you can't get it, but there's really no specific reason why you would. And why do extra tests if you don't have to? There's nothing in their urine that we're expecting to find. The other answers, however, there's a reason that we better keep an eye on them. 
Okay, 10 minutes to go. Our next question is up on the board. You're caring for a client who is just intubated, ET tube. Whew. The nurse anticipates that they're going to verify placement of the tube in what ways? There's a lot of ways that you can verify tube placement. How are we going to do it? Chest x-ray, cuff pressure, looking for chest wall movement, end tidal CO2, or an ABG. Which ways are appropriate? What do you guys think? Yes, Mary, you were quick on that one. Good job. I love to see it. I love to see it. Yep. Fred Reed, yes, good. That's excellent. Uh-huh. A bunch of you guys getting it on YouTube. Amazing. Ollie Noel. Ah, yeah, we got a good group of students on tonight. I love to see it, you guys. Super smart. You are absolutely correct, A and D. Let's talk about A first, getting that chest x-ray. Okay, listen up. Buzzword. Chest x-ray is your gold standard for ET tube placement, okay? If you get one of those questions that ask you what the gold standard is, number one, best way to do it, take a chest x-ray. Why? Because that is the only way we are actually going to be able to see with our eyeballs where that tube is. You know, we can use other methods to like kind of guesstimate and make sure it's like they're breathing, but we're not going to be able to see exactly where it is. And we want that ET tube to be number one in their trachea, number two, ending just above the tip of their carina. That's where the trachea bifurcates into the two main stem bronchi. If it goes too far, it can slip into that right main stem bronchi. No good. Then we're only breathing on the right side. We could accidentally put it down the esophagus and we could be intubating the stomach. We aren't going to be breathing good at all there. Okay. So think about what your best answer is. The only way you can see it with your eyeballs, chest x-ray, that's your gold standard. Now, let's think here for a second. You're in an emergency situation. The provider intubates that client. Are you going to wait to give them ventilation with a bag mask or hook them up to a ventilator until we can get a chest x-ray? No, of course not. You're immediately going to breathe for that client, right? And we're going to get a chest x-ray really fast. But in the meantime, there is one other thing we can do to verify placement. And that was answer choice D, your end tidal carbon dioxide. This is a nifty little device. You pop it on the end of your ET tube, breathe for your client, give them a couple breaths with that bag mask valve and watch the device. You guys tell me what we're looking for. There's two specific words. We are looking for what? When we breathe for that client with an end tidal carbon dioxide detector. Yes, we're looking for carbon dioxide. We wanna see that they're breathing out carbon dioxide, but we can't see carbon dioxide with our eyeballs. We can see that device and we can see the color of it. What's going to happen? Boom, Gupreet, you got it. Color change. That's right. We are looking for color change. If that device changes color, there's a few different ones on the market. I can't tell you exactly what color. Uh, the ones I always use were yellow, but again, it doesn't matter. If the color changes, that is indicating the presence of carbon dioxide. Boom, you are in the lungs, okay? Or hopefully in the trachea. <laughs> okay, you're not all the way in the lungs. You could still be in the right main stem bronchi. You could be ventilating the right side, but you know that you are not in the belly. You did not intubate the esophagus. So that's something you'll do like immediately while you're getting the x-ray. Now, why were the other ones wrong? Cuff pressure. Well, that doesn't tell us where the ET tube is. That tells us how tight the cuff is. So that's just plain out wrong. Why is chest wall movement wrong? I want to see that they're breathing. Well, yeah, but that doesn't tell me anything about where the EG tube is. Read that question. We're verifying placement of the tube. Putting that tube in, it can be in the wrong place and their chest can still be moving. And then same with an ABG. We're not going to see ABG changes that quickly right? Hopefully they're going to have better oxygenation and a good ABG once they're intubated, but immediately to verify placement, this tells us nothing about where the tube is. The end title tells us, yes, you are in the trachea, bronchi, somewhere in there. 
the chest x-ray shows us specifically where it is. So those are your two correct answers. Five minutes to go. Next rapid 30 question. We've got a child with CF, cystic fibrosis, and they're going to get some chest physiotherapy. So before we do the chest physiotherapy, what's the correct action here? Should you apply a pulse ox, give them their bronchodilator, oxygenate them, you know, put their nasal cannula on, or we want to have them use the incentive spirometer? What do we think? What do we think? Correct action before CPT for a client with cystic fibrosis. Okay, think about what's the pathophysiology, what does cystic fibrosis look like, and what is CPT doing to them? That's going to help you get your right answer. Okay, Ajish got it. Yes, Sharon. Amazing. Ah, oh, good. Queen, you got it. Lib, you got it. Oh, you guys. Yes, you're knocking it out of the park. You're ready. B, give them their bronchodilator. With CF, we know that they have thick, stiffy, sticky, viscous mucus. There's just like a ton of it building up in there. And that makes it hard for having good airway clearance, getting a lot of air in and out of their lungs. It's just clogged up with that gross mucus. So we do CPT to try and loosen all that mucus up and make it easier to get out. Now, there's only one of these actions that will actually help that procedure, and it's giving the bronchodilator. If we make their bronchi and bronchioles bigger, there is more room for us to break that mucus up with that CPT and help them get it out. That's why B is correct. If we go to our wrong answers, putting them on a pulse ox, giving them oxygen, even doing IS, none of those things are necessarily bad for your client, but they don't help with CPT. They don't help get that mucus out. So they're not the best answer to this question. All right, three minutes to go. Next rapid 30 question. We have a client post-stroke. Oh, this was from the very beginning. We're gonna do this one. We're gonna do this one. The nurse is conducting a health fair screening, local health fair. Okay, you're gonna definitely get some of these community health, public health questions. Which of the following should they recognize as risk factors for peptic ulcer disease? Think about peptic ulcer disease, what can potentially cause it as you're taking health histories at this health fair, what do you want to be on the lookout for specifically in relation to PUD, peptic ulcer disease? Give you a second on this one. What do we think? Okay, good. There's several correct answers here. Remember, once again, they can all be right. One of them can be right. And in here, almost all of them are right. You guys have got it. You're ready. A, B, D, and E. All of those things. There are so many things that can increase our risk for peptic ulcer disease. So we want to be aware that prolonged ibuprofen use, remember, that's an NSAID, that is going to increase our risk of bleeding. It's not very good for our kidneys, and it can really upset the stomach. So watch out for ulcers. Tobacco and alcohol, both risk factors for peptic ulcer disease. So anyone who's smoking for a long period of time should be aware of that. It causes more gastric acid to be produced, which is going to cause those ulcers. Alcohol, same way, okay? So watch out for both of those substances being used. And then lastly, that H. pylori, that should have been your dead giveaway answer. You know that's that bacteria that can ultimately cause stomach ulcers. So the only thing here was that irritable bowel syndrome, IBS, has nothing to do with ulcers, right? That's more when we have the diverticula, the little out pouchings going on. They can get irritated and inflamed and cause those flare-ups where we get either really bad constipation or diarrhea. There's a couple different types. 
We got one minute to go. I think we can squeeze in one last question, my friends. We are assessing a client who is suspected of having a retinal detachment. Remember, that's an emergency. Which statements would be consistent? So if we heard them, we would think, oh, yeah, they possibly have a retinal detachment. What do we think? Cloudy appearance, pain above the eyebrow, trouble with peripheral vision, bright flashes of light. Oh, good. Christine's got it. Liddy's got it. Jason's got it. Let's see over on Zoom. Jemmy, Diane, Mary, you've all got it. You know this. D, bright flashes of light. Now, I want to raise you one and just say there's one more dead ringer giveaway that you should be aware of when you hear a client say it could mean retinal detachment. And that is a curtain coming down over their eyes. Curtain coming down over the eyes or the bright flashes of light, those should really, really make you so concerned. And what's your priority nursing intervention? You've got to call the physician. You've got to get someone in there that can actually help because no intervention that you do is going to be effective. You can't fix a retinal detachment, monitor, check their vital signs, none of that. So call a um, call for help. Get that get that person in the room who knows more than you, and that will be your correct answer. Okay, you guys, that was a rapid thirty minutes of NCLEX questions. How did you do? What's everyone thinking? Did you like it? Was it fun? Did you get them right? How are you feeling? Wish we could do more. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, I'm glad to hear that you liked it and that you want to do more. Good. We're going to keep doing these. It sounds like these guys, these help you guys out a little bit. If you have got requests, you're like, Maureen, I want you to go over this. Feel free to shoot them my way in the chat. Let me know what you're struggling with. And that way I can throw some of those in there for you next time, guys. I'm going to try to do them very frequently, at least every couple of weeks, so you guys can keep keep joining, you know, Facebook, YouTube, wherever, just jump on with me and we will practice. I have seen a lot of you asking those pharmacology questions. So I'll make sure I add some more pharmacology questions into the next rapid 30 for you guys. Um, I'm also going to drop a link for you guys to a new course offering we have, our pharmacology crash course. And that is where we are going to teach for two hours every night in depth on pharmacology. I'll make sure to add it into Rapid 32. But just in case you guys are needing an extra resource going on, I wanted to make sure that you had that available. We're going to be offering it every single month starting in April. Super cheap for eight hours of intensive farm. So feel free to look at that if it would be of help. Even before April, though, I'm going to add more farm in to Rapid 30 because I know that that is a big request. Let me see if any more requests came in from here. Pharma and EKG. Okay, we'll get some EKG ones going in our next Rapid 30. Sounds good, guys. EKG and Pharma for these for our next session. You got it. Okie doke. Well, I will see you guys for that next one. I hope it was helpful. Let us know if you happen to need anything else. You can always reach out to us at support at archerreview.com. And we will see you next time. Bye, everyone.